nice parallel I like to draw is on-chain governance versus like soft off-chain governance like exists in Ethereum. So on-chain governance like Polkadot where it's like, like you vote and then things happen. Whereas like off-chain governance in Ethereum, it's like there are a hundred different communications mediums where conversation happens and you just kind of feel for like what the sentiment is with respect to like, oh, should we pass this EIP? It's not just like, it's not like some deterministic thing where we like all come together and vote based on the number of ether coins we have. It's like, what is everyone saying? Let's like try to reason about it as humans and then make a decision. And I, I like the Ethereum approach way more. I think like on-chain governance in a sense is kind of a flaw. Um, and so um, it's the same thing here. It's like yeah, intuition never wants to say whether or not something is true or false because like who is to say what is true or false? All we want to allow people to do is have more information when they interact with things and allow them to like arrive at these asymptotically probabilistic certainties that a thing is either true or false based on the data that exists and the people who have created that data like that's it and so like i i can't tell you whether or not you should trust someone in your group chat like the, the problem is people try to codify it they try to like turn it into this thing that is programmatic but maybe at some point in the future we will be able to do that like probably like i don't know sometime you know, next 100 years or some thousand years at some point we'll be able to do that but right now we can't and so it's like you kind of gotta like use your intuition a little bit <laughs> you gotta just like think about it and like analyze all these data points as a human be like okay well this guy in the group chat is kind of crazy so like maybe i take his opinion with a grain of salt with respect to this topic it's not like i can be like Yes, for sure, because he graduated from Harvard. I'm going to like trust this. Uh, if it's Harvard, it's like, then you know like you got to believe it. So. <laughs> if it's Harvard, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> it, it goes back to that that concept of relative trust. So um, I could trust, you know, Billy's, you know, taste in music, but I don't trust his taste in clothes or whatever, right? Like, it doesn't mean I don't trust him, right, at all. Like, there's no global trust score of, like, Billy as a person, right? There's no such thing as that. That's like a, a, a silly concept. People have relative trust. That's how the real world works today. You might trust the, the recommendation from a friend to go to a restaurant or to use a certain like service provider, but, or you could rely on like a platform with like a bunch of reviews, right? That's showing that the service provider is great or this restaurant is great. It's really your choice and how you determine how to trust someone at that point in time. And we just haven't had a way to do that, like in an online way, in a, in a safe and verifiable way. I think until now, I think we're we're still very early, but those opportunities are are right in front of us. And this concept of like the, the web of trust where you can kind of like start to inspect to see like, why do I trust someone and like start to tinker with your own relative trust score of like trusting people for certain like contexts, I think it's gonna be really cool. I just have one final question for each of you, uh, let's say one minute each, and then we can open for the five last minutes to the audience if there's one or two questions. Uh, with regards to intuition, uh, Disco and EAS. Um, going back to the first question that Evan asked, what would look like a success in the next one to two years? Like, what are you looking to accomplish? If it's not already clear for for the audience or for whoever watched the video, what would make a success? Basically, it's not necessarily an easy question, but what is your first your first uh, elements of an answer? At Disco, we think about welcoming people into Web three beyond pure financial interactions. So success looks like all of us here working together to welcome the next billion on chain so that they can do more than just push tokens around and you know perform financial actions. They are coming to the party so that they can enjoy utility. Andrew, who is also in the Zoom, is gonna kill me for saying this because he doesn't like this. Um, but like, <laughs> I think a good kind of North Star is, <laughs> it's optimistic, but it's like, a non insignificant percent of the world's data being kind of transformed into this like crypto data format. So just like making some significant percent of the world's data verifiable as opposed to like, and also like, yeah, I guess that's, that's, that was, that, that would be success if we can get more data to be cryptographically verifiable um, and to like allow it to escape all of these data silos so that we can use it and take it to different contexts. Yeah, as long as it's not all data, it reminds me of Evan at the, yeah. that there's a couple of things that should not be on chain. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Bryce. Yeah. Our, our, 
our primary purpose is to build more trust online. And we believe that attestations have been kind of that, that missing Lego piece. And I feel like trust, um, what it does is it actually improves user experiences pretty significantly today. Like a lot of application builders and it's, they're not focusing on the wrong things, but like better wallet user experiences, better, you know, scalability and things absolutely help the, the user experience, but at the root of everything and how like in users enjoy a certain application. It's about how much they trust the people that they're interacting with and how much they trust the platforms that they're like, you know, engaging with. And I feel like if we're able to use cryptography and attestation to build more trust online, that we can have like more joyous and more like engaging user experiences that go well beyond like what we've even thought of. But it's going to take time to do that. And I think everyone, like the people that are on this call are, are obviously like incredibly important we're EAF is focusing on like the infrastructure layer and making sure that we have a standardized way so we don't have all these splinters of like how to create an attestation. We don't presuppose like what the attestation is for, how it gets consumed or used, but just like how do we actually standardize around making a verifiable, you know, signature on some sort of structured data? And then you have people that are like aggregating and really viewing that information to make it make sense to people like intuition and then really building more like amazing experiences with that information at the disco front. And like, how do we all work together to build these amazing experiences and really focus on, you know, the, the growth of the ecosystem as a whole? I'll open up if anyone in the audience has uh, a question, feel free to, to ask it. Sure. I had a quick question. Yeah. Related, um, Bryce brought up this idea of like platforms and like some of these like sort of like smart contracts that you might interact with in the web three ecosystem and building trust within not just individuals. How do you think about this trust and how you can build that beyond just individuals in web three? Things can have identities as well in, re in reputations. And it goes back to just like deciding how you trust something like you could have a smart contract that gets audited and then the auditing firm attests to the, the, you know, the audit itself. And that might be great, but like, who was the auditor and like, what's the relative reputation of that auditing firm? If like multiple people audited it, or if like individual contributors audited it and attested to the safety of the contract, the more of these attestations probably would be more valuable. And so you can start to attest by having some sort of reputation from the entity that's making the attestation. You can start to build more trust for non, uh, you know, non-human type things like brands, businesses, contracts, those types of stuff. Evan, Billy, do you want to add something to this point? That implies that this information is getting delivered at the app layer. And so this also requires wallets to be able to surface some context around what Bryce was describing, whether the audit itself is still valid, whether there's been a recent hack, whether the auditor was involved in that hack. Um, and so right now, a lot of us have to go to the website of the presenting organization to look at a PDF, which is wholly not cryptographically related <laughs> to that contract at all. And so I think, you know, this is a wonderful use case and one for which builders need to push because neither the auditors nor the organizations behind the contracts are currently doing this. And I, I think there's one more piece to the puzzle, which is like giving all things or I don't know about all things, like I don't need, know if we need it down to the atom level, but like most things, a digital identity um, that kind of acts as its digital twin and interface in the digital realm. Um, so like step one is getting things decentralized or digital identifiers. And then once they have those identifiers, we can start to like build out the identity of those things. For smart contracts, it's easy because you got like an address and for people with EOAs, it's easy because you got like an EOA and that can be resolved to like a DID and you can just like create DIDs if you want over here for things. But like, I think that's a big piece that we kind of like we're at, intu at intuition, we're focusing on that, but it's like a, a big piece that probably needs a whole lot of big brain thinking around. <laughs> I have to say this conversation was so inspiring. Um, I'm already like super motivated and bullish to, to build in this space and after this this i'm like 3x more so thank you so much <laughs> uh, yeah i think i will even rewatch it a couple of times um yeah one thing it, it's more like a thought thought experiment some kind of like spiritual manifest but like i i have this this vision of uh, the last social network which is like 
the reversion that you described earlier about you know having the data as like the, the core and then the application layer as like an accessory on top as opposed to what we have now. And so how do you see this to unfold in terms of like today the the incentive is to keep on one platform and to be very strong on one platform and kind of dismiss the others, while probably the future will be kind of like the B that's like pollinating like across many, many networks. And then like the new winners are the ones who can easily switch from one network to another. And like, how do, how do you kind of imagine that unfold and how do we describe, let's say the next two to three years in terms of like in that inversion, like leverage and, and power shift between uh, big platforms and, and us, the data, the data producers. I'm happy to go first on that one. Um, and I think the answer is in the name, like social network. It should be social network as opposed to social application. Like the present social networks are just social applications. And I think the future of social networks, maybe there's one network, but like maybe there's many. Um, it's just many apps powered by social protocols. And so I think every app can become social or at least a little bit more social than it is now when you can just like import this dynamic live data about things into any application super easily and take your data with you wherever you want to go and so i think that's what it, I, I think that the answer is in the name it's like the, the future is a social network as opposed to like siloed social applications and that's we have to we have to make sure that we're also focusing on like standardization at the infrastructure layer to a degree. I think that doesn't necessarily mean that it excludes like voices at all. It's really important that the infrastructure layer has like the voice of the community to make sure that we're all operating on a similar standard. Because if you start to splinter at the infrastructure layer, what ends up happening is like then all these like applications start to splinter as well, and we have this disjointed um, like inusable uh, ecosystem and it's just going to be much harder to accomplish what we want if we do have these different social protocols we still have to figure out how do we actually build trust within them and how do people forward their trust or their identities and and you can do that with a, a standard um a little bit of homework to invite people to think about how we have tried to tackle these challenges in the past um, there was a company around 2014 called Lulu's in the United States. It was like Yelp, where you could leave reviews of men who you went on dates with. You could rank them out of 10, tag them with various different terms, and this website was taken down because it violated the individual sovereignty of the in, of the people who had been reviewed on the site who didn't really like the way they had been reviewed. And so I think there are you know a number of examples, Third Web being another from the 90s, where you could annotate other websites. It was taken down because it did not include sanctioned derivative works that allowed you to, you know, as, as people annotated the original sites. So there are interesting challenges for us as we try to solve similar problems, but using a more open, more verifiable, more consent first way. Um, I think often in Web3, we don't necessarily always pull from those Web2 examples because we don't like them a whole lot. But there's quite a lot, I think, for us to learn from early crypto and even before that, when we talk about social platforms and trust. To the, the builders, like uh, all the people on this panel are extremely accessible and approachable to answer questions. So if you're listening to this kind of post chat, uh, the best way to learn and to get engaged and to like make a, a true impact is to ask questions and, and to help educate. We're so early in like identity. And I know it's been a problem that we've been trying to solve for so long, but we're still so early. And the more educated people get around the subject and how we start to like communicate it with a similar language and uh, how we as builders unite together to actually build for a better future, I think the better. So just get engaged however you think you can contribute and you'll be welcomed with open arms. Perfect. Okay, we just had one like thought on that. I'm at DotCon right now and uh, everyone is talking about these things. So I just want to think like, what is the thing that you would want to see built through this hackathon when everyone is talking about it in such a fragmented way? What is like the final note for builders in, in this hackathon? Talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. And go to Harvard. <laughs> Yeah, B build with purpose and intention. Like, don't just solve something because you think it's like a, a flashy thing to do. Like, really consider, you know, why are you solving what you're solving? And is it truly important to you? And do you see it as a problem to be fixed? 
And there's a lot of, uh, you know, technology that's available through this hackathon to kind of weave like a, an amazing solution together, but really like to take the time to really think about the purpose of what you're building first. And it's going to be pretty obvious how these solutions come together. And if you're ever at a loss for, for what to build, I think probably the people on this call have like a million ideas of things to build. So just reach out to us because there's like, again, this is a massive puzzle. There's an infinite amount of pieces that need to be solved. And so we can very much point you in a potentially inter interesting direction if you don't have a direction that you are going in by yourself. We, we uh, just a quick note, we do have a page on our docs called Ideas to Build, but it has like a lot of thought starters. They're not like specific ideas, but it's just meant to probe like how you should think about important problems to solve. Um, and that could be a good place if you need some inspiration. <laughs> Thinking about our financial